Live from Washington, D.C., it's theCUBE, covering .conf 2017. Brought to you by Splunk. Welcome back to the nation's capital, everybody. This is theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage, and we're here at day two covering Splunk's .conf user conference. Hashtag SplunkConf17. And my name is Dave Vellante, I'm here with my co-host, George Gilbert. And as I say, this is day two. We just come off the, came off the keynotes, more of a product orientation today. George, what I'd like to do is summarize sort of the, the day and a quarter that we've had so far and then sort of bring you into the conversation and get your opinion on what you heard. You were at the analyst event yesterday. Uh, I've been sitting in keynotes. We've been interviewing folks uh, all day long. So let me start, I mean, Splunk is all about machine data. They ingest machine data, they analyze machine data uh, for a number of, of purposes. The two primary use cases that we've heard this week are really IT, what I would call operations management, kind of understanding the behavior of your systems, what's, what's potentially going wrong, what, could, what needs to be remediated to avoid an outage or remediate an outage. And of course, the second major use case that we've heard here is security. Uh, some of the Wall Street guys, I've read some of the, the work this morning, particularly Barclays came out with a research note. They had concerns about that, and I, I really don't know what the concerns are we're going to talk about. I presume it's that they're looking for a TAM expansion strategy to support a, a $10 billion valuation and potentially a much higher valuation. Um, it's worth noting the conference this year is 7,000 attendees, up from uh, 5,000 last year. That's a 40% increase growing at or above, actually, the pace of revenue growth at Splunk. Pricing uh, remains a concern for some of the users that I've talked to, um, and I want to talk to you about that. Uh, and then, of course, there's a lot of product updates that I want to get into. Splunk Enterprise 7.0, uh, which is really Splunk's core analytics platform. Uh, ITSI, which is what I would, the 3.0, which I would call their, their ITOM platform. UBA, which is User Behavior Analytics 4.0. Uh, updates to, to, to Splunk Cloud, which is a service for machine data in the cloud. Uh, we've heard about machine learning across the portfolio, really to address uh, alert fatigue, uh, and a new metrics engine called MStats. Um, and of course we heard today enterprise content security updates, uh, and many several security oriented solutions throughout the week on fraud detection, ransomware, <clears throat> they've got to do, deal with Booz Allen Hamilton on cyber foresight, uh, which is uh, security as a service that involves human intelligence, uh, and a lot of ecosystem partnerships. AWS, uh, uh, Dell EMC was on yesterday, Atlassian, Gigamon, uh, et cetera, growing out the ecosystem. So that's sort of a quick rundown, George. I want to start with uh, the pricing. I was talking to some users last night before the party. You know, what do you like about Splunk? What don't you like about Splunk? Um, are you a customer? I talked to one prospective customer who said, wow, I've been trying to do this stuff on my own for years. I can't wait to get my hands on this. Existing customers, though, only one complaint that I heard was your price is too high, essentially, is what they're telling Splunk. Now, my feeling on that, and Ramo uh, from Barclays mentioned that in his research note this morning, uh, Ramo Lencho, uh, a, a top security analyst, uh, securities analyst uh, following software industry. And my feeling, George, is that historically, your price is too high has never been a headwind for software companies. You look at Oracle. Uh, you look at ServiceNow, who, you know, sometimes customers complain about pricing too high. Splunk, and those companies you know, tend to do very well. What's your take on, on pricing as a headwind or, or tailwind indicator? Well, the way you always set up these questions in a way that makes the answering them easy, because um, it's a tailwind in the sense that the deal sizes feed an enterprise sales force. And you need an enterprise sales force ultimately to be pervasive in an organization because you can't just throw up like an Amazon style console and say, you know, pick your poison and put it all together. There has to be um, an advisory, a consultative um, sort of approach to working with a customer uh, to tell them, you know, how best to fit their portfolio right. and their architecture. So yes, the price helps you feed that, what, what uh, some people in the last era of enterprise software used to call the most expensive migratory uh, workforce in the world, which is the sales, you know, enterprise sales organization. Sure, right. Um, but what, what's happened in 
in the different, in the change from the last uh, major enterprise applications, ERP, CRM, and what we're getting into now is that then the data was all generated and captured by humans. It was keyboard entry. And so there was no, the volumes of data just weren't that great. It was, it was human, uh, essentially business transactions. Now we're capturing data streaming off everything. Um, and you could say Splunk was sort of like the, the first one out of the gate doing that. And so if you take the new types of data, customer interactions, there are about 10 to 100 customer interactions for every business transaction. Then, then the information coming out of the uh, IT applications and infrastructure, it's about 10 to 100 times what the customer interactions were. So you can't yeah. price the, your, your pricing model, if it stays the same, will choke so you. So you're talking about multiple orders of magnitude yes. of, of more data, yeah. and if you're pricing by the terabyte, right. then that's going to crush your, your customers. Right. But here's what I would argue though, George. I mean, and you mentioned AWS. AWS is another one where complaints of, of high pricing. But if, to me, if the, custom, if the company is adding value, uh, the, the clients will pay for it, and, and when you get to the point where it becomes a potential headwind, the company, Oracle is a classic at this, will always adjust its pricing to accommodate both its needs as a you know, public organization and, and a company that has to make money and fund R&D, and the customer's needs, and find that balance where the competition can't get in. And so it's, it seems to me, and we heard this from Doug Merritt yesterday, that his challenge is staying ahead of the game, staying, you know, moving faster than the cloud guys yeah. in what they do well. And to the extent that they do that, I feel like their customers will reward them with, with their loyalty. Um, and so I, I feel as though they can adjust their pricing mechanisms. Yeah, everybody's worried about 606 um, and you know, the, the, of course the conversions to subscriptions. I, I feel as though a high, high growth and adjustments to your pricing strategy I think can, can, can address that. What do you think about that? Um, it's, <laughs> it sounds like one of those sayings where the, where the French say, well, it works in practice, but does it work in theory? Oh. <laughs> um, but it has worked in practice in, in the industry, hasn't it? But you're, what's, take, so what's different uh, okay. now? Okay, so take Oracle. At list price for Oracle 12C, um, flagship database, uh, the, the price per processor core, with all the features thrown in, is something like uh, 300,000, 350,000 per core. So you take an average Intel, you know, high-end server chip that might have 24 cores, and then you have two sockets. So essentially, one node server is um, 48 times 350. And then, of course, Oracle will say, you know, but for a large customer, you know, we'll knock 90% off that or something yeah, like well, that. Yeah, exactly. Which is exactly what the Splunk guys told me yesterday. But it's um, that's what I'm saying. They'll do what they have to do to maintain the footprint in the customer, do right by the customer, and keep the competition but out. If, if 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 it's multiple orders of magnitude different, if you take yeah. the open source guys, where essentially the software is free and you're just paying for for <laughs> maintenance, yeah, um, oh, oh, and humans. Yeah. Okay, that's the other advantage of yeah. Splunk is they've you know as you pointed out yesterday they've got a much more integrated you know set of offerings yeah. and services that dramatically lower them. I mean, we all know the biggest cost of IT is people. Right? It's not the hardware and software, but um, all right, let's, I don't want to rat hole on pricing, right. but that was a good discussion. But what did you learn yesterday? You sat through the analyst meeting. Um, give us the rundown on you know, George Gilbert's analysis of .conf generally and Splunk as a company specifically. Okay, so to, for me it was a bit of an eye opener um, because I got to understand sort of, I've always had this, uh, sort of feeling about where Splunk fits relative to the open source big data ecosystem. But now I got a sense for what their ambitions are and what their, what their sort of tactical plan is. Um, so I've said for a while Splunk's the anti-Hadoop. You know, uh, Hadoop is multiple sort of dozens of animals with, you know, three zookeepers. And I mean, literally. <laughs> yeah. And the, the upside of that is the, those individual projects are advancing with a pace of innovation that's just unheard of. The problem is the customer bears the burden of put, putting it all together. Um, Splunk uh, takes a very different approach, which is they aspire apparently to be 
just like Hadoop in terms of the platform for modern operational analytic applications, but they start much narrower. And it gets to what Ramey's point was in that Wall Street uh, review, where if you take at face value what they're saying, or you listen just to the keynote, it's like, geez, they're in this IT operations ghetto and security and, you know, that's a La Brea tar pit and how are they ever going to, you know, climb out of that to right. something really broad. But what they're doing is, they're not claiming loudly that they're trying to topple the giants and take on the world. They're trying to grow in their corner where they're defense, you know, they have a defensible sort of moat. And um, basically the... Uh, let me interrupt you, yeah. but to get to five billion yeah. or, or beyond, they have to have an aggressive TAM expansion strategy kind of beyond ITOM and security, don't they? Right, <coughs> and so, so that's where they start generalizing their platform. The, the data store they had on the platform, the original one, it's kind of like a data lake in the sense that it really was, it's the, sort of the same uh, searchable type index that you would put under a, a sort of a, a primitive search engine. Mm -hmm. um, they added a new data store this time that handles numbers really well and really fast. That's to support the metrics so they can have richer analytics on the, on the dashboard. Then they'll have other data stores that they add over time. And for each one, you're able to now build um, with their integrated tool set more and more advanced apps. So you, you, you can't use a general purpose data store. You've got you've to use the Splunk um, data. It's kind of like Workday. <laughs> yeah, well, except that they're adding more over time and then they're putting their development tools over these to shield them. Now how, how seamlessly they can shield them is, remains to be seen. Well, but so this is where it gets interesting. Yeah. Splunk as a platform, as an application development platform on which you can build big data apps, yeah. is it's certainly, conceptually, you can see how you could use Splunk to do that, right? And, and so their, their approach is, out of the box, will help you with um, enterprise security, um, user, they call it user behavior analytics because it's a term another research firm put on it, but it's, it's really any abnormal behavior of an entity on the network. And so they can go in and not sell this kind of fuzzy concept of a big data platform. They said, they go in and sell, you know, the security operations center, we make your life much, much easier, easier and we make your organization safer. And what they, they call these curated experiences. And the reason this is important is, when Hadoop sells, typically they go in and they say, well, we have this data lake, which is so much cheaper um, and a better way to collect all your data than a, than a data warehouse. These guys go in and then they'll add what more and more of these curated experiences, which in, is what everyone else would call applications. And in the research Wikibon's done, depth first, or rather breadth first versus depth first, De, uh, breadth first gives you the end-to-end -end visibility across on-prem, across multiple clouds, down to the edge. But then when they put uh, security apps on it, when they put DevOps or, or um, uh, uh, some future sort of big data, big data analytics apps as their machine learning gets richer and richer, then all of a sudden the idea is they're not selling the platform because that's a much more time intensive sale and lots, lots more of uh, objectives. Uh, right, I'm sorry, solutions, objections. those depth solutions. Yes. And it's then all of a sudden you wait, the customer wakes up and he's got you know, a dozen of these things and all of a sudden this is a platform. Well, ServiceNow is similar in that it's a platform. Yeah. And, and when Fred Luddy first came out with it, it was like here, we said, well, what do we do with it? So he went back and wrote an IT service management app. Yeah. And he said, oh, okay, we get it. Splunk in a similar way right. has these sort of depth apps and, that's, and as you say, they're not selling the platform because they say, hey, you want to buy a platform? People don't want to buy a platform, they want to buy a solution. Right. Having said that, that platform is intrinsic to their solutions when they deliver it, it's there for them to leverage. So the, yeah. the question is, do they have an application developer sort of kit strategy, if you will, yeah. whether it's low code or even high code, yeah. where, in, 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 where they're cultivating a developer community. Is there anything like that going on here at .conf? Yeah. Um, they're not making a big deal about the development tools because that makes it sound more like a platform. Yeah. But, but they could. But they could. <laughs> and and the, the tools, 
you know, so that you can build a, a user interface, you can build dashboards, you can build machine learning models. The reason those tools are simpler and more accessible to developers is because they were designed to fit the pieces underneath, the foundation. Whereas if you look at um, you know, some of the open source big data ecosystem, you know, they've got these um, notebooks and other tools where you sort of, you address one back end this way, another back end that way, and it's sort of, you know, you can see how Frankenstein was stitched together. Uh -huh. Yeah, know. so, I mean, to your point, I mean, we saw fraud detection, we saw ransomware, we see this partnership with, with Booz Allen Hamilton on Cyber Foresight. Uh, we heard today about Project Waitono, which is unified you know, moder monitoring and troubleshooting. Um, and so they, they have very specific solutions that they're delivering uh, that presumably many of them are for pay. Uh, and, and so, and bringing ML across you know, the platform, which yeah. now opens up a whole ton of opportunities. So the question is, is are these sort of incremental, defend the base, you know, and, and, and grow the core solutions, or are they you know, radical innovations in your view? Um, I think they're trying to stay away from um, the notion of radical innovation, because then that, that will create more pushback from, from organizations. So they started out, you know, they started out with a sort of Google search-like like product for log analytics. Right. And you can see that as their aspirations grow for a broader set of applications, they add in a richer foundation. There's more machine learning algorithms now. Um, there's, you know, they added that new data store. So, and, and when, you know, we talked about this with the CEO, Doug Merritt, yesterday in the analyst day, he's like, yes, you know, you look out three to five years and the platform gets more and more broad and at some point, you know, customers wake up and they realize they have a new strategic platform. Yeah, and, but, and, and you know, platforms do beat products um, and, and even though it's hard to sell, if you have a platform like Splunk does, you're in a much better strategic position. All right, we got to wrap. Uh, George, thanks for uh, okay. joining me for the, for the intro. I know you're headed to, to New York City for Big Data NYC down there, which is you know, the other coverage that we have this week, so thank you again for coming on. Okay. All right, keep it right there. We'll be back with our next guest. We're live. This is theCUBE from Splunk.conf 2017 in the nation's capital. Be right back. <laughs>